Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out. As I've been doing these uh, the last number of years, what I have kind of done is just put together, um, tried to put together a snapshot of where we are in the district, using data points to highlight some of what we're talking about, what we're looking at, what we're dealing with. This isn't intended to be a grand proposal or a pitch to um, get support for a referendum project or a budget or anything like that. It's just kind of an open-ended um, series of data points to look at uh, where we are, what we're doing, where we're going. So I'll go through the, the slides. It's very brief, only 60 slides. And, uh, and then you can ask me any questions you want uh, for as long as you'd like. But I'll move through the 60 quickly so that uh, you're not here forever. Um, and this was working two minutes ago. So hopefully it'll, it'll get back to working. Listen to the teacher. Okay, so I'm going to touch on three, three areas. Demographics, academics, and uh, a silly term, frivolous term that I threw up, which is acrobatics. And I'll, I'll kind of get to what that means. So to start off, just in terms of demographics, the demographic that we look at most frequently is um, enrollment. And as you all know, probably, or at least most of you do, our enrollment has been growing just about every year uh, for the past decade. And not only is our enrollment growing, but our enrollment is growing more than just about any other school district that you can find uh, in New Jersey. So I've just taken the Morris County K-12 through districts for this slide. Um, but what this shows, and by the way, some of the slides are a little bit hard to see, but we'll post all of this on our website tomorrow. Um, what this shows is just percentage growth or decline over the past 10 years. And Chatham, as you can see, uh, if you're able to make it out, is this top blue line. So our rate of growth has outpaced the rate of growth of every other Morris County school district that's configured as a K-12 school district. The majority of districts in the county have either had a flat enrollment or a declining enrollment over the past decade. And we've bucked that trend. And of course, there are um, pressures that accompany growing enrollment, uh, financial chief among them. This is just a look at, inside the district, what's been happening and what we project will continue to happen for the next couple of years. And that is that uh, for a while, and it looks like, yeah, um, our elementary schools, our K-3 schools, were, were kind of close in enrollment. And over the past number of years, there's been a divergence. Uh, so we are gaining more kids at Southern Boulevard School, and we're losing kids at both Milton and Washington. And that's important for us because it determines how we allocate our classrooms, our programs. Right now, we're in the process of shifting programs from Southern Boulevard School to Washington Avenue School and Milton Avenue School. Um, but this is a, a, a trend that, um, if it continues, we'll have to take more steps. Uh, and that will probably involve, at some point, some kind of redistricting, uh, because Southern Boulevard is, is just taking up a, a greater proportion of the enrollment K-3 uh, than it has in recent years. This is something that I, I pulled out of a couple of sources, um, and it looks at census data from 1990, 2000, 2010, 2015. And what's interesting about this is it shows the, the population, in this case in Chatham Borough, next slide is Chatham Township, um, by age, you know, pretty much five year segments. And when you think about it, if you, if you go through the lines, so the blue line is, is 1990, red is 2000, uh, orange or whatever color that is is 2010, and green is 2015 you'd kind of expect the lines to do what they're doing right here, meaning that 1990, you know, 10 years later, you'll see the same, you know, slope. But if you look down at the school age population, you can see that there's a little bit of a bucking trend uh, for whatever reason. The reason is probably that people are moving to town um, at some point when their kids are school aged. And if you think about it too, probably the age of the parents in this, of these students is right in here somewhere, um, 40s and 50s, most likely. Chatham Township is, has had, had something similar. Uh, so again, you can see that there's a little bit of a, 
a bump for school-aged kids. And interestingly, in both the borough and the township, you look at the trough, it's kids who go to college. The population of 20 to 24 year olds drops dramatically because all the kids, I would imagine, that's my hypothesis, uh, leave Chatham and, and head off to college. Uh, another stat on demographics is that the median household income in our two, two communities has grown at a faster rate than the median household income growth over time in the state of New Jersey. So going back to 1990, uh, you can see that Chatham Borough wasn't too far off of the average in New Jersey, and Chatham Township was a little bit above that. Uh, but they've grown pretty markedly over the past 25 years. Also demographically, um, the complexion of the district has been changing. So if you take a look at um, the white population, and I'm using the terms that are either in the U.S. Census or the state of New Jersey NJ Smart system, which is what we have to report. Um, Chatham Borough, Chatham Township are the first two blue lines here. Uh, school District of the Chatham's grade 12 is this blue line, and this is the average for uh, the district. And then you can see as you go down the grade levels, uh, Chatham's becoming less white. And the groups that we are um, where we're increasing is in the number of Asian students and the number of students uh, who have are, come from two or more races. And part of that is that the state of New Jersey's reporting system now classifies Hispanic as two or more races. So that's a technicality, but the takeaway really is that um, ethnically we're becoming a little bit more diverse. So speaking of the takeaways, um, just in terms of broad snapshot demographics, uh, our school district has grown significantly over time. It's grown faster than just about any other school district you can find. It's become wealthier and it's become more ethnically and racially diverse. Academically, where are we academically? So <clears throat> this background slide, there's a reason for this. It's not just uh, random purple bubbles. This actually is a screenshot from a New York Times article that appeared about a year ago. And the title of the article was Money, Race, and Success, How Your School District Compares. Uh, these were the authors of the study, and then these were the authors of the article. Uh, actually, these were the authors, one of the authors of the article, the other is the authors of the, the study itself that was summarized in the article. And what this uh, graph shows and Alan Ruth was the first person to turn me on to this, so he's sitting in the audience there. Uh, it takes a look at the socioeconomic status of a family, with poor being down here on the x-axis and wealthier being over here. And then it looks like at standardized test scores in grade six. And when students reach grade six, where are they in terms of grade level achievement uh, on their standardized test scores? This is every, the purple dots represent every public school district in the United States that has a sixth grade. So, uh, you can see the graph kind of goes from three grades below grade level to three grades above grade level. And the center is somewhere, you know, right here. So for example, in Camden, which is one of the poorest cities in New Jersey, by the time kids get to sixth grade, the average student is scoring on standardized tests two and a half years just about below grade level. In Carteret, uh, in the middle of the pack, uh, they're about average in terms of socioeconomic status and average in terms of standardized test score. Where I grew up, Beverly Hills, I'm just joking, um, <laughs> they're further along on the, on, the, uh, on the arc there. And then there's Chapman. Uh, all the way up there. So that's kind of remarkable uh, when you think about it, especially if you compare the typical kid in Camden by the time they get to sixth grade to the typical kid in Chatham, you're talking about five years difference um, by sixth grade for the average kid. So that kind of informs these more familiar numbers that we often um, share and talk about. They're on our school high school profile, uh, you all have seen them if you've had kids that have applied to college or you've sent kids to college, and many of you I know have. Um, but this is the, the post-high school plans 
last three years, how many kids go to four-year schools, how many kids go to two-year schools, how many kids do something else like enlist in the military or um, go to work. And it's important for us, I think, to communicate to our kids that this is not normal. <laughs> it's not the average. It's not typical. Uh, our students don't really recognize that. They think that this is what it's like everywhere. Of course, this is a direct uh, symptom or, or result of being up here on the edge of the world in terms of student achievement. So then, more familiar numbers uh, are those students that do go to four-year schools, how do, they, how do they break out? What kind of schools are they going to? And what we've always used as a, as a metric or as a barometer for how the kids do and where they go is the Barron's Profiles of American Colleges. And again, those of you with high school or college level kids, you know that there are about a half a dozen different categories from most competitive to highly competitive to very competitive and so forth. And you can see that the bulk of the students that graduate from Chatham High School and enroll in four-year schools end up in these you know, top-tier universities and colleges. So numbers that you don't always see and that we talk about and look at and are important to dig a little bit deeper, um, for example, are our special education kids. Uh, so I took every single, uh, and I can see for the most part where kids have gotten into schools by now, thanks to Naviance, this year's class, 2017. It's not totally complete yet, but I took the numbers based on um, what I can see in our data uh, and then last year. So I went through every kid who is classified as special education, this graduating class in a month from now, and last year's graduating class. Uh, there were 63 kids. And then I took a look at um, either where they, uh, where they were admitted to, basically, the schools that they, you know, they applied to. And again, you see that on the special education side, our students are doing great. They're actually well, well, well above the average nationally, uh, or the norm nationally for how special education lenders do. Took the same two classes, and I went back to uh, what they were doing in sixth and seventh grade, uh, just to look at how, uh, if they were receiving not special education services, but basic skills instruction. So these are students who are maybe in our uh, Excel program at the middle school who um, are not classified, um, but need some extra support sixth or seventh grade. And there are, were 44 of those students. And you can see that 96% of them, these are the kids who are struggling in sixth and seventh grade, 96% of those kids uh, are off to four-year schools. And Kim Lanza, our supervisor of that department, is sitting in the audience, so she should get a pat on the back. So then sometimes people say, well, yeah, you know, we have a lot of high flyers, then we have, you, you pay a lot of attention to special ed kids, but it's those kids in the middle, they just get lost. I've heard that a hundred times if I've heard it once. Um, so I went back to last year's class, 2016, and I took the middle 33% by GPA. You list every single kid, the middle 33. So these are the, the middle of the Packers um, at Chatham High School. 99% of those kids are going to four-year schools, 1%, two-year school, and there's nothing wrong with a, with a two-year school. So then you can look at where the special education students go, and I didn't include, these, this, these percentages are not the ones going to four-year schools, they're the totals. So the two-year, you know, there's another 10% or something, whatever it was before, going to two-year schools. But you can see the bulk of them, uh, the vast majority, going to highly very and uh, competitive schools and according to Barron's. The BSI students, uh, something similar, again, 75% of them, or 85% of them, uh, are going to excellent colleges, universities all across the United States. The middle third, um, they're going to these schools at the same rate as um, you know anybody uh, could expect or want. Uh, almost all of them going to these excellent schools and universities. So interestingly, 24 of these kids, so these are the dead middle of the pack, 24 of them going to the most competitive colleges and universities in the United States. So let's look at the 24 uh, a little bit more closely. So 
24 of them go to the most competitive schools. Everyone knows the Ivy League. Then there are other schools up there like Boston College, Colgate, Lehigh, MIT, et cetera, et cetera. Just as examples of those kinds of schools. And I always like kind of digging into this because we have a lot of discussions with parents about this kind of thing, beginning at Lafayette Avenue School. Um, and it has to do with the trajectory of kids, the path or the track that they're on, uh, coming out of Lafayette Avenue School, worried about taking honors classes uh, in middle school or high school. So the 24 kids in the middle of the pack who went to most competitive schools, uh, when they were hit ninth grade uh, back in the day, they had the opportunity to take up the four honors level classes, right? In ELA, math, science, and social studies. So of those 24, um, none took four honors classes. Four took three, eight of them took two, five took one, and seven did not take any honors class in ninth grade. If we look at the whole, what's that say? Uh, thank you, thank you. This one's even better. The, Class of 2016, so these are all the kids last year, all the kids that went to highly competitive schools. The whole class, not just the middle of the Packers, 72 kids in the whole class. And these are schools like BU, where my wife went, Clemson, TCNJ, Muhlenberg, Virginia Tech, um, etc. So 70 of the 72 started as CHS students. Uh, again, they had the chance to take up to four honors level classes in those core areas. And of those 70, so 70 kids, four of them took four honors level classes, 16 took three honors level classes, 15 took two honors level classes, 10 took one, 25 did not take an honors level class. So the point of this is, or the reason I like to talk about this is, there is so much anxiety sometimes uh, among kids that they have to be in honors classes. And they have to be in this class in seventh grade because when they get to ninth grade, they have to be in that class. And that really doesn't hold up when you look at the data and where the kids ultimately go to school. 70 kids, 25, more than one third, uh, didn't have an honors class. Now, looking back at this year's students, so there are 325 kids that are gonna graduate a month from now. Um, 306 of them started out with us. This is kind of neat. Uh, there's a lot of movement, right? So it's not rigid. If you're in seventh grade and you're not quite in the level of ELA or math class that you might want to be yet, um, you don't have to rush to get there. You can, you know, be enrolled in a class that's appropriate for you. Uh, and then when you get to ninth grade, you can make choices about what the future of your high school experience will look like. So interestingly, 18 of those kids started out in a certain number of honors level classes in ninth grade and ended up having to bail on one or two classes. 59 of them, wherever they started in ninth grade, they ended up taking on more honors level classes the next year. And one thing to think about, I think, is you know, I'd rather, if I'm talking with a student or I'm a parent of a child who's kind of pushing and really wants to be in a, in a certain class, but maybe it's borderline, I'd rather be in this group. You know, I'd rather take it slow. I'd rather not overwhelm a kid when they enter ninth grade. Uh, I'd rather them get their feet underneath them and then decide to, to challenge themselves a little bit more when they hit tenth grade, as opposed to biting off too much or more, they, more than they should or can chew and then having to kind of take a step back. Another thing that's, that's super interesting is that the state of New Jersey about five years ago began um, following your kids once they leave Chatham uh, and once they leave all the high schools in New Jersey. So they work with all of the colleges and universities in the United States, not international schools, but those within the United States, and they track uh, whether or not the students, after they graduate from public high schools in New Jersey, stay in college 16 months after they graduate. And we have been fortunate that we've had very high rates of continued college attendance 16 months out 
but when you look in those numbers a little bit more closely, um, it's very interesting. So we, we run about 90%, as you can see. General Ed is right there, uh, about 90% also. But Special Ed, and I can see that they might not be going to all the same schools uh, as some of the General Ed students are. Uh, but there are years when our special education graduates are staying in college at a higher rate than our non-special education kid, uh, graduates, which is awesome. Uh, that's just a chart to look at the same thing. So, takeaways. Um, our students attend college at high rates. Our students remain in college once they graduate. Uh, and we graduate students at all levels who attend and remain in college uh, long term. So, now the, the silly part of it, right? Where are we acrobatically? And I'll kind of explain what, what that means in a minute, but it kind of gets to the question of, what is it like for a student to be here? Some of you maybe grew up in communities just like this. I didn't. Um, but none of us grew up in a time period similar to 2017 uh, with the kinds of uh, technological resources and social media you know, platforms and so on that students have. And it might not be so easy uh, to be right here in all ways. In some ways it's, it's great, but in other ways it might be kind of challenging. So, as a segue, um, we conducted a survey. We, this is the second time we've done this. This year we uh, partnered with something called the Madison, the Chatham Madison Coalition, which is kind of a union of the municipal alliance committees of the two communities. Um, and we surveyed our middle school and high schoolers about their habits, uh, related to substance abuse, their views on certain issues. So I'm gonna share, we're gonna post this to our website tomorrow along with this presentation that I'm giving. Um, but I'm gonna just kind of hit some of the slides that I think are pertinent, or most pertinent to the discussion tonight. And granted, it's a little bit hard to see this. So the first question is how many hours per night uh, of sleep do you usually get, uh, usually spend on homework, sorry. And this left side in this slide is middle school and the right side is high school. So you can see as kids move from high school to middle school, they end up spending more, much more time doing homework. And that pinkish bar is the three to four hour range. So between the pink and the blue there, more than half the kids spend three plus hours a night doing homework and many of you are nodding your heads. Uh, how much sleep do you typically get? And here it's kind of the opposite effect. As kids get into high school, they sleep less. And that's bad for a whole host of reasons. And if you look down here, you're talking about um, on order of almost 50% of the kids sleeping seven hours or less, uh, or six hours or less, sorry, every night. Not really sustainable. How do you feel to sit in silence with no distractions? And the blue bar uh, shows that students would feel calm and appreciate being able to do that. And the pink bars, uh, sorry, the, uh, the green bar shows that they would be tired and fall asleep. About a third of the kids would fall asleep if they were just sitting with no distractions. Uh, this survey enabled us to pull data based on gender. So this is kind of interesting. Males on the left, females on the right. And you can see that the female students are spending a lot more time on homework than male students. Response to stress by gender. Male on the left, female on the right. And um, this blue bar, the first one, is I feel calm and cool under pressure. The green bar is um, I feel jittery and cannot sit still. Purple is angry and have outbursts often. And blue is I stay away from people, or the purple, I stay away from people. So you can see that the, the response to stress um, on the part of the, the females is a little bit more acute. How many hours of sleep do you typically get? Twice as many female students report getting five or fewer hours of sleep. During the past 12 months, did you ever seriously consider attempting suicide? This is back to middle school and high school. That's 5.7% of our middle schoolers and 9.6% of high schoolers. 
Did you ever make a plan to commit suicide? 3.5% middle schoolers and 5.5% high schoolers. Substance abuse, um, you can go through this as it's posted to the website. I know it's hard to see, um, but I'm going to highlight uh, a couple of things that um, are trends for us. Um, one thing that's extremely concerning is that during the past 30 days, did you use uh, a prescription medication, a pain reliever, without a prescription? That's this first one. The middle one is amphet uh, amphetamine, stimulants, and the last one is tranquilizers. But that first one, these are the opiates, pain relievers. And I don't think I need to tell anyone here what's happening in New Jersey in terms of uh, opioids and addiction. There's going to be a presentation at Chatham Township Municipal Building on Wednesday night. And on May 30th, um, over at the high school, there'll be a presentation sponsored by Chatham Borough about the opioid crisis. But what we know is that oftentimes the gateway into heroin is pain pills. This is a question about perception. How much do you think people risk harming themselves if they do any one of these things? And, and there's a lot of bars here because it's middle school and high school. But the two that I circled, this one is high school marijuana. And the, you know, the, the two, um, the blue here and the green here is no risk and slight risk, right? So students don't perceive smoking marijuana as being or trying marijuana once or twice as being that harmful. A new trend for us is that they feel the same way about e-cigarettes and vaping. And this has been our one of our biggest challenges at the high school and to an extent at the middle school too. We have a lot of students who are vaping uh, because it's, not, it's odorless for the most part. It's difficult for us to track. Um, they're using these devices that look just like USB sticks that you put into a computer. So they're small, um, but that's a new trend. Um, how wrong do, you, uh, do your parents or guardians feel it would be for you to do these things? So this is like what they think you guys think. Uh, and the same, the same uh, pattern is here. They don't think their parents would disapprove too much uh, if they're vaping or smoking pop occasionally. How many hours a day do you spend texting, emailing, video chatting, or socializing online? And you can see uh, the numbers here kind of increases as they go uh, to high school. Have you ever sent a racy or sexual picture of yourself to someone? And that's something we've dealt with numerous times in the district. And even though the numbers don't look big, you know, 2%, 12%, um, they're big if you're the person who did it, and dozens and dozens of people have uh, an image that you wish they didn't have. So we're working on that. Uh, during the school year, how many times do you do something to purposely hurt yourself without wanting to die, such as cutting yourself or burning yourself? And you can see we're close to 5% at the middle school and 3% at the high school, and that's something that our student assistance counselors deal with uh, fairly regularly. So, acrobatically, uh, my point there was uh, it's hard to balance all of this. Right, so our students are killing it academically, just absolutely killing it. Uh, but some of them, not all of them, but some of them are stressed, not sleeping enough, and they're engaging in behaviors that are concerning. So back to the, the kind of the question, what does it mean to be up there at the edge of the universe um, if you're just an average student? or way above average, or below average, right? Not so easy necessarily to function in that kind of um, you know, pressure cooker. So from a faculty standpoint, um, I discussed a whole bunch of this at the beginning of the year with our staff, but we're focusing probably, it's safe to say, in, on three areas. Most of our professional time is spent in these three areas. It's spent on other things too, but these are three areas that are con consuming our time. The first, of course, is just curriculum and instruction, right? We want to make sure that we're um, preparing kids and engaging kids in meaningful work and teaching them effectively so that they can crush it academically. Um, we've had a significant focus on wellness, both for faculty and for students, to try to raise awareness about these issues and to help students uh, acquire some of the skills and the 
the dispositions that will help them to be well adjusted and able to manage uh, what they're dealing with. And then of course, like everyone in the world, we're reliant more and more on technology and we're in the midst of distributing devices to students and working inside Google Classroom and other platforms. Uh, and so my thinking about this is we're trying to help kids be prepared, we're trying to help them function uh, from a point of well-being, and we're trying to help them deal with this increasing connection that we all have through technology to everybody. And our goal has to be, in part, to find balance, uh, help our kids find balance in this, in this mix. And it's hard sometimes to be balanced like an acrobat uh, when you're up here and everyone expects you to be up here and everyone expects you to jump from here to up here uh, and do it all. It's not so easy. So our goal is kind of to create uh, well-beings who can function on their own, who are self-reliant, uh, who are prepared, connected, uh, and so forth. So what are we doing to try to do that? The first thing, of course, is that we're always trying to improve our curricular program. And I just, this is not an, an exhaustive list. Um, I just highlighted a few things that we've done over the past several years to really kind of deepen uh, our curriculum. I could put a hundred more bullet points up here, but we want kids to be interested in what they're doing and find meaning in what they're doing. And to do that, we have to ensure that we're constantly improving um, what we offer them uh, so that they can, you know, delve into a, a an area of study and derive a lot of meaning from it. We're also uh, increasingly trying to hit on non-typical academic areas. So for those of you with younger kids, and I see a lot of uh, veterans in the crowd, not as many maybe at the very young levels, but we've been focusing a lot on mindset, growth mindset. That's uh, research primarily out of Stanford University and Carol Dweck. Um, but it's, it's about having a perspective that um, informs you to understand that you can always get better. And that if you're not good at something, it's because you're not good at it yet. Not because you're never going to be good at it. Uh, we have all kinds of mindfulness, meditative, you know, contemplative sorts of uh, initiatives popping up here and there to try to help kids just um, find some space between stimulus and response. Uh, we're changing up our furniture again, thanks to CEF and the PTOs, uh, so that kids have a little bit more, a little less rigidity in the classroom and can move about uh, better. We have character ed programs. We have two terrific student assistance counselors and Alex Emmer and Lisa Latarulo. They've been running parent programs. They've started pushing out a newsletter. Uh, we've partnered with Mac. We've made some adjustments to how we do homework and we've been running a faculty wellness program for three years now. And the message that I gave to our staff on the first day is the same message that uh, I think they've been trying to deliver to students and the teachers they work with and everyone, which is we can all be more balanced. Uh, none of us is perfectly, that perfectly balanced acrobat yet, uh, but we all can keep trying to get there together. And that's the quick snapshot of the district right now. So 60 went fast, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Mr. Ruth. Just a comment on stress. I work with a couple of universities where my children have gone to do go to school right now at, at the president and university level or, or their, their uh, colleagues at that level. And at these two universities, both of them have mentioned a significant increase in the stress of students going to college there right now as compared to say five years ago and they're having to hire a lot more student assistance counselors for college that's costing them a lot more money mm -hmm. it's putting budget pressure on them so what you're seeing here is now being reflected in college too yeah, if i recall suicide is the second leading cause of death on for college aged kids don't and I want to Google that after this presentation, but I believe it's a, it's about that's a, about where it is. Ms. Clark. Um, when you when our kids come back after 
going to their first year, their second year, what's they, what are they bringing back to Chad? What are they reporting? Do they feel prepared? Do they feel successful? Do they feel that the work that they have done here has prepared them and they feel that the effort that they put in is not bringing them to that next level or bringing to level where they can feel successful and decrease their success? They always say that. They, they absolutely always say that from the time I was at the high school every day till when I pop in and, w and listen to some kind of program. Um, and they often say that they're, they feel so much better prepared than the peers with whom they're going to college, which is great. But they don't get that perspective until they leave Chatham. So when they're in Chatham and it looks like it's coming easy to this person and this person and this person and this person and they feel either inadequate or like they need to work even harder because doing four hours of homework isn't quite enough. That's the that's the rub of trying to get them to get that perspective. Mr. Um, Marino. Question about the charts and like the kids going to certain colleges. Do you do you have that data like taking into account that certain kids may have or may have received an athletic scholarship uh, and may skew the numbers somewhat, or is it just really for the whole district as a whole? It's funny, it's for the whole district as a whole. Um, and I was, two years ago when I did this, or maybe it was last year, I looked at every single kid who got any kind of monetary anything for athletics, and it was fewer than 12 kids. There are so few students that we graduate who receive any kind of scholarship athletically. Um, I can't tell which kids got into a school that was slightly better because either they played an instrument or they you know, were involved with robotics or they played a sport. But it's a, I think that there's a bit of a myth in this community that being really good at a sport is a, is a one-way line to a D1 scholarship. There is so little that, and the kids who did get money, the majority of them did not get a sum that would you would consider very significant. Yeah, as, well, as opposed to just the money, are they getting, are they, what I'm saying is, or what I'm asking is, are they getting help getting into the school? And maybe they didn't get a scholarship at all. Sure. But uh, some of them for sure. sure. I mean, absolutely. Not, or, or, yeah, well, absolutely. There's no question. I mean, if you are involved in yeah. an array of activities, you're more likely to get. Um, you know, to, to be able to access the school. And certainly, I mean, athletics are great. I'm a huge proponent of being involved in that way, and it's a healthy outlet for most kids. Um, but I think there's an over, there's a perception that it's, it's what's carrying the day. And it's, it's certainly not what's carrying the day in terms of most, like this, those 70 students are certainly not getting into all of those schools because of the instrument they play or the sport that they play. To your point about the special ed kids who are actually doing better in a way than, than the regular kids, I had one of my children who was a special ed child, and and uh, one of the one of the things that he got in high school was help in managing his time and in uh, doing checklists and coping with stress, and that has lasted him all the way through college and beyond. And his siblings, who weren't special ed kids, didn't get that. And they probably are more stressed than he is. Interesting. Um, you, can, you I've seen you look at sleep and homework. Do you ever look at kind of the kids that are active athletically to eighth grade and then just don't make a team or stop being athletic in high school? Like, do we have any understanding of the number of kids that were highly athletic until they hit ninth grade? And then have a change? I don't know that. We'd have to survey them because we don't, you know, we don't run sports K. Um, that's all rec. But we we have to survey students. That's an interesting thing to look at. Do you think those kids are sleeping more as a result of not? No, I think they're more at risk for having anxiety and stress and mm -hmm. don't have stress relief because they're used to exercising and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden there's no spot for them mm -hmm. and we don't have intramural. So it's just, I wonder. I don't think it's only stress, but I think it's the being part of the community that also causes some type of anxiety. They've been, they've identified themselves as, you know, an athlete or maybe as 
um, a, a band member and they don't get into the elite. Mm -hmm. I don't have music for children, so they select choirs or whatever. And that changes their identity. Mm -hmm. Oh, I missed it. Mr. Clark. Along the lines of homework, is there coordination between teachers to not have tests, you know, overlapping uh, on subjects, especially in high school? For the most part, no. For the most part, it's that we try to communicate the message to the student that if they have, you know, multiple assignments on a certain day, that they should speak with their teachers, and we, um, and I think most of our teachers are quite um, accommodating once kids approach them. We've looked at different ways to try to manage that, but it's extremely difficult at the high school because each student obviously has a different you know, teacher for every subject. So if I'm a social studies teacher and I have 110 kids, let's just say, they each are going to have literally six different teachers. So it's not even like I can go and look at four teachers, like the middle school teachers can do this. They have a team, they know there are only five other or six other teachers that are working in their unit. At the high school, it's a hundred different teachers. Um, that's a challenge that we have not solved yet. But it's on the student then to say, hey, I'm... The self-advocacy is on the student. Some of them do yeah. that well and some of them don't do that well. Gotcha. So this slide is my favorite slide. Uh, you know, that was my <laughs> And I think it's great that all of us are seeing this, but I think the people who really need to see it are our kids. Yes. So, I mean, I have an eighth and a tenth grader. I would, you know, the ship is somewhat sailed for my tenth grader because she now knows exactly what classes she's taking junior and senior year. But, but for my eighth grader, even, I, you know, as he embarks on his high school experience, I just think this would be wonderful for these kids to somehow see at their, I mean, not now, but their ninth grade meeting. You know, I think it's a balance of, of scaring them too much because we don't want to have such a focus in ninth grade on college that.